Today's scripture reading is Job 38, 1 through 11. It can be found on the overhead screen. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God. The Lord answers Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is it that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? <laughs> On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the room? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. The word of the Lord. Lauren, thank you for that lovely reading of some overwhelming words that God gives to Job in the midst of his predicament. Our gospel lessons finds the disciples in a predicament. Let us listen for how Jesus responds to them in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. Listen again for God's word. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took, with him, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up, and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we dive uh, too deeply into the red letters of the text, a little bit of preface that kind of ties in to what we're doing. A few weeks ago, we shared with you some of the next steps for our congregation as our session gets ready for where we feel God is leading us as a congregation. We find ourselves here. We're looking to get there by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, uh, we are contracting with uh, a firm to help us uh, consider a new logo for our congregation. I don't get terribly excited about this stuff because I think the logo of the church is always Jesus Christ, right? But we live in a time and culture where colors and aesthetics and symbols are meaningful. So I'm really supportive of our congregation's endeavor uh, to brand who we are and effectively communicate the story that we're trying to say. So this past week, 
this firm comes back to us and they say, based upon the four hours we spent with you, and based upon the demographic information that we find here in Boise, we want to describe the average 37-year-old male in Boise so that you can effectively communicate the gospel to this theoretical God. So they gave us these characteristics of a 37-year-old guy here in Boise. They said, first, he's relatively satisfied. He's probably a middle-class guy who's got 2.3 children at home with a beautiful wife and a decent job contributing to the local economy here. So he feels pretty satisfied in life because he's able uh, to pretty much do what he would like. Because he's a hard-working, middle-class guy with 2.3 kids and trying to make sure his family is happy, he's a busy guy. So his evenings are filled with commitments to work and to family. Saturday is devoted to soccer practice. Sunday is devoting a few hours uh, to rest because he's been working hard all week. In spite of all these outward appearances, because he is a millennial in the United States, and because relationships are often used for appearance, sometimes he feels a little lonely in the midst of his family. His relationships are not as deep or as authentic. So design for churches are saying that the average guy out there is a little lonely. He also feels unprepared because we're moving into this next phase of culture here in the United States where boundaries are taken down and in many ways anything goes as long as you have some money in the bank and you look like you're staying busy. He feels unprepared to live this life that culture is kind of thrusting him in towards. Unprepared to raise his family according to some set of morals that he's trying to still figure out in and of himself. And because he feels a little unprepared in his family life, those anxieties go into his workplace, into ever-shifting cultures in the local economy. Does his skill set match what his company needs today or five years from now? Is he prepared to keep his job? He's feeling a little unprepared of that. Because of that, he's feeling afraid. Will he be able to maintain this lifestyle that seems really good on the outside, but inwardly, they feel <coughs> So he's also feeling concerned. So what do I do with all this if I feel safe to share this information with one or two people that I trust? But he's also feeling, according to this company, a little hopeful. That maybe the answers to his deepest questions exist somewhere, maybe in church or maybe in a community organization. He's hopeful that maybe there are some answers to the life's deepest questions. Okay, so this is what verbatim what the company is presenting to us. And they say, we need to use really specific language to speak to that 37-year-old as Covenant seeks to reach out to the community. They say, you should use language that no matter where your journey has taken you, you are welcome to come alongside us in this journey as we try to find God, or as in good reformed language, to allow God to find us. They're saying we should communicate that we are a safe place for your family and that we will accept you just as you are. So for this first round of four hours of information and some logos, which our team is going to be looking at and probably showing to you in the next week or two for you to look at, we've spent about $1,300. A pretty good deal for logo branding marketing concept. But I look at this information and I'm like, you know, the average 37-year-old that you presented to me, you've given me some helpful language, but all of these characteristics 
don't apply just to 37-year-old males. I believe that they apply to my five-year-old son. They apply to a 37-year-old male like me. That they apply to our 59-year-old female sitting out there. That they apply to our 84-year-old folks in support. I don't know that they told us anything new, but they are helping us derive some language that I believe might be encapsulated in this phrase. We are all here, and we're all trying to get there. With this work with the marketing folks, here we are as a church covenant, June 24th, 2018, we're here. But we're trying to get there where God is calling us out into the community to share God's love effectively and with passion to a world that so desperately needs God's love. But individually, we're here. A 37-year-old male dad trying to raise my children amidst a busy work schedule that demands a family and culture, and I'm trying to do that well to get them there. Some of you are at a place where you're thinking about retirement. That wonderful day looms within the next few years. You're here. You're looking to get there. How are we going to do that well? And I believe that for all of us, wherever we find ourselves, we are here trying to get there. Where are you trying to get to, my friend? A place of peace, a place of meaning and of purpose. The good news is that Jesus is here with us, and he wants to go there with us. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to the disciples, Let us go across to the other side. Jesus desires to be with us as we go from here to there, wherever life takes us. And the scripture goes on to say these words. While they were trying to get from here to there, a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? So he woke up and Jesus rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And then do you know what happened? The wind ceased and there was a dead calm. And Jesus said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Including the passage, the disciples were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? As we are all trying to get from here to there, no matter if we're 5 or 37 or 55 or 84, as we journey the seas of life trying to get there, it is inevitable that the storms of life will batter us. If you came here looking to find the message of life is going to be easy and good, uh, there's probably a few other churches that I've found that will give you that message. But the truth of the gospel is this, that Jesus <coughs> never said that your life would be easy. In fact, this scripture affirms the reality as we all make the journey that the storms will come, the winds and waves will batter us. I was with a good friend uh, in my office this week. We were chatting about the tragedy of life. And a loved one uh, had recently fallen and had some significant damages and were probably not going to be able to walk again. This sounds terrible. If 
put it in the language of my culture, forgive me, but 37 year olds will appreciate this. Like that just sucks, right? <laughs> There's no other way around it. What do we do as people of faith when these situations confront us? When we hear news that a loved one may be bound to a wheelchair for the rest of our life. When that awful C word, cancer, is spoken to us by a doctor. What do we do with that? When the storms come and the waves pound us, do we just give up and say that life is terrible? While we acknowledge the reality of life, our Christian faith has an even deeper meaning and hope attached to it. Friends, these waves and wind will come. How do we react to it? The Christian life, I think, is looking at the wind and waves and running to our Lord Jesus as those disciples do. Now, I don't know that those disciples knew what was going to happen. They went to Jesus. They didn't say, can you calm the sea? They said, teacher, you're asleep. Do you not care that we're all dying here? And sometimes we feel like that, right? That life seems overwhelming, and we might run to Jesus and say, do you just not care about my situation because it doesn't seem hopeful? Scripture doesn't say that they wanted Jesus to calm the wind and wave. But in Mark, Jesus gets up and he looks to the nature surrounding him and says three words Peace. Be still. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus got to the living room of our homes and said to us, said to you, Peace. Be still. The wind and the waves come in life. The wind and the waves come, came to our Lord Jesus. <coughs> Jesus wasn't just some divine superman. Being fully human, he too experienced the tragedy of life. And when the end of his life was drawing near, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed. He knew that his execution was about to take place. And he prayed to God the Father, God, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. You can hear the humanity in his voice. I don't want to go through this. This is going to be painful and hard. I'm going to die. I don't want to do it. But Jesus has the terrific faith to say, not my will, but your will be done. And what happens? Does God rescue him? for this execution? No. The sea waves batter upon Jesus' ship, and he is taken as a fugitive of the state. And in a terrible trial, he is executed to death. Jesus felt the tragedy of life. It is the Christian story that even as we face the tragedies of our own lives, that we remember in the person of Jesus Christ, there is always resurrection. The wheelchair is never the end of the story. Cancer is never the end of the story. The anxiety about your finances is never the end of the story. The end of the story is that Jesus is drawing all things into the death and resurrection of him. We all die to our sin, which is overwhelming. And in our baptism, we are also raised again in Jesus' resurrection, where we can look in the face of death, look in the face of hell, and say, Christ always wins. For us Christians, there is always hope. So as we face the own storms of our lives, I think that we have a few options here. We can choose to be afraid. We can choose to believe that death may have the final answer. 
or we may choose to have a little bit of faith. Now, as you encounter the storms in your own life, I offer three ideas for your practical advice as we walk this journey of life. The first is it, this. The disciples, even though Jesus accuses them of not having faith, they turn to Jesus. And how often do we turn to booze, to our work, to sex, to other various addictions and vices to take our minds off of the storm when it says Jesus, Jesus is inviting us to come to him. Those disciples went to Jesus. Those disciples allow the storm of the sea that day to strengthen their faith. The storms are inevitable. And the disciples use that experience to have their faith deepened. They lead to. And if Jesus has the power to say to the wind and to the sea, peace be still, doesn't Jesus have the power to speak that into your heart? that you may find shalom in the midst of a raging sea. So those red letters as we work our way through this sermon series, I believe that Jesus' words spoke to those disciples and continue to speak to us. Imagine Jesus speaking this to you. Why are you afraid? In me there is life and peace are you afraid? Have you still no faith? May we all turn to Jesus in the midst of our storms that we may find hope and faith in him, the one who lives, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Friends, we continue our worship through an offering. This is not